offenders who have some interest in health issues. And we all realized we were funding something related to Alzheimer's or dementia care. And we said, uh, wouldn't it be great if we just had everybody, the, some of the, uh, uh, um, a representative sample of some of the projects we were funding so that we make sure you all are talking to each other and that we as funders are hearing from everybody as well. And we had so much good works that we wanted to share this. So that was really the impetus for, we had a kind of a round robin uh, what, a month or two ago and said, gee, it would be great if we could hear a little bit more about these three projects. So that is, that is why you have been invited. So why don't we uh, start with introductions? Let me start with my colleague, Melanie. Melanie Mitchell, we're at St. Luke's Health Initiatives and our the Director of Strategic Community Partnerships and oversee our grants process. I'm Pat Elder with the Dan Foundation and I'm also the Director of Public Foundation Foundation. I'm Stephanie Walsh with the Banner Alzheimer's Foundation. I'm the Development Manager. I'm Jan Dorian, I'm the Director of Grand Valley Community Services at Banner Alzheimer's Institute. Terry Leon, Program Officer at Piper Charitable Trust. Good morning, I'm Tom I'm our Bureau Chief of the Arizona Department of Health for Chronic Disease and Tobacco. Hi, I'm Mary Thompson with the DHHS Legacy Foundation. Mary Goodman with Piper Trust. Suzanne Pister, SLHI. Good morning, Michelle Jaspi, out of campus president of CPS. Yeah. I'm Tina Lawrence of the University's campus. I'm the director of education. Barbara Wood of the Attitudes campus, director of development. I'm the board here in the Red Makers Forum, the communications and members of the Associate. Barbie, AGF, member engagement and director. Kelly Salonkin, AGF, director of member services and program. Good morning, everyone. I'm Laurie Miles, I'm the CEO of Arizona. Jill Hamilton, medical director at Costa Costa Valley and also with the Beatitude Advanced Alzheimer's Machine. And I'm Kristen Pearson and I have Costa Costa Valley as well. I'm the program manager for the palliative care for dementia post cancer care. Cheryl Thomas, Costa Costa Valley, director of institutional giving. Thank you. And I do want to uh, just direct the, and thank Wayne for coming. Uh, Wayne's not a presenter and not a funder. But well, sorry about that, but the Department of Health Services, but they uh, track the four leading causes of death in Arizona. And uh, dementia and Alzheimer's has moved up into the top four. I don't know if that's good or bad, uh, but additional monies can be allocated to those top four. So stroke, lost out, that was stroke before, but. But <laughs> 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 so yes. So I can't read that as a from here, but um, so we're going to start with uh, Jill. Okay. So and we do we have people on the line? Did I miss anybody on? No. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we may have people people on here. Oh, okay. Sorry. I'm sure I had it somewhere and I didn't put it down, so I apologize. So, Dr. Hamilton. Thank you. Did you um shoot off the video? No. Okay. I was waiting. Is it on here? Yeah, it's just like on the agenda. Yeah. You want to show that first? Yeah, why don't you show that first? Um, I'm Joan Hamilton with Hospice Valley and Jan and Tina and I have worked together for 25 years. So uh, this is oh, good to see the whole continuum. I was posting, I hired Jan and went back and stole her. <laughs> and I brought Tina to the attitudes and she has just gone through the roof the creativity and brilliance and innovation. So we've got the, the kind of spectrum of Alzheimer's here. It's perfect. And it makes sense to start with palliative care for dementia because we think people, Jan and I are kind of early and, and Tina's kind of later. So I'm going to start with a video that St. Luke's made of our program with gratitude for making it. So we've been doing videos about each of our innovations projects just to describe what innovations is, what they are. Thank 
heart disease or lung disease or all these other diseases where social workers can kind of help them navigate the healthcare system. But they did not want to take the mental patients because they're so different. So we had nothing. So we decided to develop this palliative care for dementia program. And thank the Lord for the Virginia Piper Trust and Legacy who got us started on the <coughs> program. And St. Luke's, I'll explain how they came in later. So we developed a model and it involves home visits twice a month the first month and then once a month from a social worker. It doesn't have to be a social worker, but it happens that all our dementia educators are social workers right now. At any time, they can call me and discuss the medications, which turns out to be a big need. And because the social worker's already been in the home, because I have the records, because they've listed the meds, I feel comfortable giving advice by phone, which sometimes you don't. And we also do it by, it's kind of a Skype, but it's a, a private Skype so that I can see the patient if I need to. But I don't have to go and visit, so it's much, much less expensive. That turns out to be a big benefit, and when we presented to the Alzheimer's Association, they said, oh wow, that's something we don't have. Uh, we, have a, we have a triage line anyway for hospice with nurses around the clock, so they get to <laughs> kind of tap into that, which is huge. In the middle of the night, their husband is rattling around with the knives down in the kitchen, and they'll call us, and, and our nurses have been trained and trained and trained on dementia advice. And they also, which is a huge pull, get four hours of a volunteer respite every week, if they want it. And most of them want it. And that volunteer has also been trained, goes into the home, spends four hours so that the family member can get out, or takes the family out. We even have a couple who go and volunteer for us at our thrift shops with their volunteers so that they can do something meaningful and get out of the house. So this has been huge. It's very interesting. Families who can afford private pay respite prefer the volunteer. I, I don't know quite why, but they do. So this costs $275 a month to work. So this is what I just talked about. The big discussions are education about the disease, a huge emphasis on advanced directives. They need permission for these people with dementia to say, don't go to the hospital. Don't put them on a breathing machine. These are interventions you know when a person with dementia goes to the hospital, they're going to become delirious, confused, paranoid, hallucinating, tied down. It is no place for someone with dementia. So when we discuss that and put that in writing, that makes a huge change. And I know Janet and Tina are nodding because we all have to deal with these patients in the hospital. And it's a uh, we also do a lot with polypharmacy. These people are on so many medications, and they're they're anti-lipid medicines. For somebody who's going to live a year at best, just and they're have, all medicines have side effects. The lipid medicines make people weak. As soon as we stop them, they get better. Some of the Alzheimer's medicines sometimes help in a third of patients, but they also cause gastric distress. So we may stop Aricep, and they eat better. The, and then. A lot of these families really want to keep their loved one at home. So we also contracted with Altex, two plans, Mercy Care and Bridgeway. We've taken 121, the goal was to have 120 patients and 120 matched controls. So 120 patients receive palliative care for dementia for a year, uh, but right now we're still working on them. So we have 121, we've had at least three months, and they have a matched control. And the beauty is that Altex has full financial numbers. This is very rare that you can get this kind of data with a matched control. And we reduce costs for everything. Hospital, SNCC, pharmacy, equipment, chemotherapy, transportation. And here's just a summary, and this is preliminary. Uh, the Altex control group costs Altex for everything. And everybody knows what Altex, Arizona Long Term Care System, mm -hmm. Medicaid in a nursing in Medicare for people, Medicaid for people at a nursing home level of care, although they may be a homeowner group. So it costs them $1,862 a month for the average patient. 
to be cared for by Altex, who has dementia. And by the way, dementia costs are in the hospital are five times more than non-dementia patients. And for a palliative care for dementia patient, we dropped it down to 1464. So we saved $398 per member per month, significantly more than the 275 is cost. And the, probably the most beautiful thing is that we almost eradicated nursing home placement from 81,000 to 3,000. So this service really kept people out of nursing homes. And there are times when nursing homes are very critically helpful and important. And I'm not against nursing homes at all, but if a family wants to keep somebody at home, we want to help. And I would say that um, the Banner Alzheimer's Institute is also a huge partner in this because they never know who to go to for help. And we can just say, go to Banner Alzheimer's, they'll get you diagnosed, they'll be your neurologist, they'll give you all the information you need, and then we'll help with supporting you at home. And when we run into people who really need to be seen at home and they are just not ready to hear, you know, drink the Kool-Aid, then we call them, right? So it's great collaborative for complex people that we can't figure out because we're not in the home. So it just shows a marriage made in heaven. Yeah, Dr. Terrio, who's the head of Banner Alzheimer's, called me Monday this week. Yeah, this week with this patient who has only moderate Alzheimer's, in fact, lives at home with her husband and went on and stopped eating and drinking almost completely about six weeks ago and he was beside himself uh, he was very attached to his family in a good way and uh husband was a lawyer money was no object you know can't you fix her and i said well, why don't you send her a general psychiatrist? oh no no can't do that she's got to go to gardner so we have a dementia unit we have a palliative care unit just for dementia called gardner home which is has a nurse around the clock and it's it's interesting. Gardner Home sends patients to Beatitudes, and Beatitudes sometimes sends people to the Gardner Dementia Unit. So a real partnership there. And we took this lady in, and it, it was very funny because she had swallowing studies. She had an ENT eval. It looked like she could swallow. I called all her doctors. I called her psychiatrist, who said she had a psychotic depression five years ago. Give her one dose of Risperidol. And, then, and that night, she drank like four huge glasses of water. Family was ecstatic. The next morning, they asked what she wanted for breakfast because she hadn't eaten for six weeks. She said, well, eggs, scrambled eggs. And then she said, oh, I wrote it down. She was hysterical. She said, I don't want to do everything for my family in one day. So she was just <laughs> furious with her husband because he'd taken a trip to Germany for two weeks and left her behind. And this looks like this was all a huge anger ploy. So who knows? But she ate pot pie last night, so things are going well. <laughs> so, but that's an example of the partnership between Banner Alzheimer's and us that works beautifully. So for the private credit program, we served 196 patients, and people just love it. Uh, we have volunteers, and that's another huge part. 2,600 hours of respite volunteers, and we're always looking for volunteers. Kristen picked pick this quote. I think it's a little over the top. She's a saint. She's an angel. I don't have words to describe how precious she is. <laughs> So for the program, the feedback has been awesome. We couldn't have done it without the PCD program. Their support made all the difference. We loved hearing you're doing it right. Suggestions of how to do it better were so welcome and reassuring. Everyone who is caring with someone with dementia should have this service. I feel like I have learned so much from our dementia educator and feel comforted knowing my mother's behaviors are part of the disease progression and I should not take them personally, and that is such a huge key. So we did this for a, about a year and realized there was something that we weren't yet getting, that we were missing um, something to help that family member other than education to deal with this. So we decided we wanted to give them a mindfulness program. And there is a huge program 
started by John Cabot Zinn, who's a physicist uh, from MIT back in Massachusetts, called Mindfulness Based Stress Reduction. It's an eight week course, two and a half hours a week, where you train in mindfulness. And it, it has incredible effects. So we decided we would adapt this to a much shorter, six weeks, two hours a week program adapted for dementia caregivers. And so we went to St. Oh, and they uh, MRIs before and after the program, the whole program, not ours, uh, show the amygdala shrinks. And that's the area that processes anger and fear. And the hippocampus and the temporal lobes grow. And that's the area that has memory and also a kind of a calmness and peace. In, so, the, uh, in the patients, that happens? No, this is for people who go through the program. Oh, okay. Because we also offer the program. I got trained and certified in the program, so we also offer it to our staff, to the public, to anybody who wants to take it. Did somebody say something? So, no, we have to back on them a little thing about doing it for the patient. I'll let you know about that. Not very successful. So you're doing MRIs on the caregivers? Let me go back. The MRIs were done in Massachusetts. Oh, oh on before. Oh, I okay, I got you. I got you. <laughs> okay, good. No, we haven't done it on the caregivers. We'd love to okay. if uh, Banner Alzheimer's would like to fund it. <laughs> <laughs> Coming right up. That would be awesome if we could show it for caregivers. But I, there's a, a lot of data. This was started in 1979 at the University of Massachusetts Medical School, and they've done lots and lots of data. The interesting thing is, once your brain changes, and we have incredible feedback from people, if you keep practicing half an hour a day, four or five or six days a week, you keep those changes. If you never go home and do anything mindfulness again, you go right back to your old brain. It's very interesting. So this was our short program, and we uh, went to St. Luke's, and they funded us fantastic. And so we taught this to 29 caregivers last year. And we did a lot of uh, scales on them. This is just a summary. The perceived stress scale on the caregivers before they took the course and at the last class went from very high to high. They're all very, very stressed, as you can imagine, and with a probability of 0.001, which is awesome, which is what everybody dreams of. The burden scale, also very, very high for these people, went from moderate to severe to mild to moderate, 17% reduction in six weeks. Again, highly significant. And then mindfulness, which of course we expected, went way up to correlate. So it looked as though the mindfulness correlated with the burden and stress. There was, of course, a benefit of a bunch of caregivers getting together and talking and supporting each other. And that's why we did the mindfulness scale. We wanted to show that it was beyond that. Keep this program going forever. I love it. <laughs> Here's one for the, yes, I'm starving for friendship. I mean, they never get out. They never meet their compadres unless they have a support group, and that's usually once a month. This class is making me see the value of being in the present, it is only by taking a break and breathing as we learn to do I can survive at all. Without this class, where would I be? And there were so many comments like that. Of course, it's been wonderful. Every caregiver should take it. I was able to get support from people who understood. There aren't that many low cost or free things out there for us caregivers. It's hard in so many ways. And this was offered at no cost. And we gave them a, a respite. Um, nursing assistant while they were in the class. So um, I love this one because this is Don and his wife. And he was in my class actually. We met on Saturdays because someone just couldn't get away there for me. And Don uh, was extremely anxious. And he said his worst time was meal times. I just could not enjoy them. And I, Took some notes on it. He said, meals with my wife are always so stressful. I get the meal on the table immediately. I'm thinking what I need to do. The dishes, getting her brief change. How am I going to get her to eat? What if she doesn't like it? What about the dishwasher? Will she take her medicines tonight? Just 
very, very stressed at dinner time, which is a tough time for anybody who's an action. And then he, by the, it was the fourth class, he came in and said, I just can't understand it. For the last two weeks, meal times have been wonderful. She seemed so content, and I really enjoyed it. Why is that? And of course, everybody in the class said, Don, it's you. Mm -hmm. you know, you're able to be mindful and not thinking about a thousand things. You're in the present. He said, oh my gosh, you're right. That was really very cool. So he asked if he'd come out and take a picture, because he said he'd started sitting with his wife. They sit in these two chairs. So there's Don with his wife, and of course, idealistic me, his wife has advanced dementia. I, I thought, oh, I wonder if she's you know, listening to her breath. So I go up to her, and I pull my chair up next to her and say, well, let's go see the wine now. She said, trying to figure out what's for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, I, it didn't seem to work at all for people with at least this degree of dementia, but it sure worked for their caregivers. So some of the things we're working on. Uh, we would like to partner with the Area Agency on Aging in Maricopa County Human Services to work with their sale members who um, are case managed. They're often living alone and they do have dementia and their case managers aren't sure how to manage. So we'd love to send out our dementia educators with them. Just for two months. It turns out two months has a huge impact. You don't have to do this forever. Uh, so we'd love to do that. We obviously want to do more and more mindfulness classes and we are doing one, two, two more this fall, and then uh, the Bee Foundation funded us for two more in the spring. Uh, here's our biggest challenge, if anybody knows that had an access. Um, <laughs> Altex programs agreed to fund this if our data was significant. Well, our data is beyond significant. So we went to them and said, okay, put your money where your mouth is. And they said, oh, you know, things are tougher this year, and we can't take it out of administrative funds. So we need a way to be able to bill access for this service. So we're meeting with them in a couple of weeks, but that's our, our biggest challenge. You know what you should definitely do? The access is, is go soliciting comments for their waiver. And so between now and September 30th, they're taking public comment. You should submit this and say Absolutely. one of the things you should ask access to or CMS to do. The waiver is basically access's memo of understanding with CMS on how to operate our Medicaid plan. And you can say we've shown the dollar savings. What we want you to make sure you do is in your waiver allow for reimbursement for this kind of activity. Yeah. That's the governor views but you yeah. uh, if you go to, we can send I'll you send the you link uh, but you absolutely should get something in because all of that goes to CMS and it basically allows access to modify their waiver which allows them to change some of the reimbursement activities yeah like charge copay well yeah yes <laughs> <laughs> that too but we've been submitting stuff on a more proactive role where we've been able to show if you do this there will be savings so you've got so if you can highlight that story and submit that that will help yeah yeah now's the time we, we get this chance every five years so this is the time to so all of you i mean if you've got comments boy now's the time to get them in because they have to show get or access has to show CMS what kind of comments they've gotten and particularly where you can show dollar savings and improve care. It, it, what we've been asking is just ask for to access is ask for the ability to pilot, you know, get some flexibility in the waiver to allow you to pilot some of these. And so rather than having to keep going back to CMS and saying, can I ask for this? Let's ask for it in the waiver. Great. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it would get, I would put the data in of your savings because uh, that, that, that's what they want to hear. And this is a very replicable model. Oh, yeah. We did apply to the innovation grant, but 
uh, DES already has it for the, is it DES? For the last round, so I don't know what the chances are. In other words, it's already in another Arizona group. Another I think might be that if you can find out of CMS is, is uh, reimbursing for palliative care or my training anywhere else in the country. They yeah. are reimbursed. They, we did get a grant to do palliative care through CMS, but not in that case. That would be heart disease, lung disease, or cancer. Hmm. You know, do I have a phone call next week with Karen Trist? And I'll just go to the other way. Great. Yeah, this would be awesome. And it's, yeah, it's very, there's nothing we're doing that anybody in the country couldn't do. But we tried to make it very replicable. And then we need more volunteers. The other thing we're doing is a work, like we're working on workplace models. So we already have a contract with Avnet, and we're meeting with these other people in the next couple of months where we do webinars um, every, I think with Avnet it's quarterly with all their staff in the United States, or it could be any English speaking country about dementia care. And then they can call or email questions for either the social workers or myself any time during the three months in between. So they're paying a lump sum for that. We'd like to work with SRP in particular with local companies so that we could actually hold little groups at the workplace. So we're working on that part of the model also. That's it. I know we look at our office of nine with three of us that are taking care of parents with dementia. So a third, <laughs> and uh, one that was just in a severe accident who's now got a traumatic brain injury. So that's four out of nine. So uh, if we're a microcosm of, of the world, <laughs> that's that's exactly where people are, what people are facing. So I want to be respectful of time. So let's uh, transition to Tina. Tina, sorry, Not a, I apologize for uh, yeah, the other you know, see if it works. Do you want to take your videos here? I do. Is that the end? Okay. Do you want me to go there first or do you want to wait till then? We'll move the pool with Okay. Okay. Hopefully it'll play with the Justin and Justin. It's on drive. Okay. So thank you so much. It's, it's such a pleasure to be here and being such a esteemed, um, such esteemed colleagues. Thank you, Jill. I wouldn't be able to be added to campus if it wasn't for you 17 years ago. So this is Culture Matters, Living Better with Dementia. It's a focus that um, helps organizations, nursing homes, assisted living, use comfort as a vehicle for assisting folks who have trouble thinking. We would not be sitting here today if it wasn't for the Legacy Foundation. We believe that in our early days, maybe 10 years ago, if you hadn't seen something in us that we probably didn't see ourselves, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be here talking and we wouldn't have some of the numbers of folks that we've been able to serve over the years. And I also have to say that, that um, the Comfort Matters program, its roots were based in the work of the Alzheimer's Association 10 years ago. And there was a time when, when Jill and Jan and I were sitting in a, a place in San Diego, where we sat and kind of sketched out what this program should look like, and today it pretty much is in that form. The Beatitudes campus has been serving the broader community for 50 years. We just celebrated our 50th anniversary, and we're a nonprofit, faith based organization. We're grounded in faith, but we're spurred on, driven by innovation. We're a community that serves all, regardless of origin, sexual orientation, gender, religious background. So we welcome the greater community and we've created a place for folks who have all been over the last 17 years, a place at the table where they're honored and their autonomy is preserved. 17 years ago, the campus understood that it could do better in serving folks who have dementia. We were struggling with what was evidence-based and what could ultimately uh, be the best course. Um, we went to the literature to see what was available and, and, to our, uh, and to our surprise, there was really nothing there. With, with 
guide us in how we should proceed. So we started it looking at how do we how do we really serve people best. Um, there was some pivotal work um, from Thomas Kitwood that really illustrated how personhood and the pursuit of comfort could ultimately serve folks in a way that was meaningful and really celebrated who they were. And so we initially began with that and through the efforts of, of Dr. Gary Martin and, and Dr. Jill Hamilton, we set forth trying to figure out how to best serve these folks, especially folks who had moderate to advanced dementia, focusing on the palliative side of the disease and how we could best support these people and their families as they progress through the disease. This is what we've learned over time. The people with dementia are best. Their lives have the most quality when they're free from pain, when they can sleep when they're tired, wake when they're not, when they can eat what they want, when they want, when their ADLs, their, their care and services delivered in a way that is meaningful for them, when the environment is engaging and supportive, it's meaningful comfort. Comfort and stimulation, comfort and quietness, and that the environment really has to support the person regardless. We've had some points of pride over the years. Many of them were the result of our funding and support from the HHS Legacy Foundation and also Mary Joy here instead. We began the program in 1998. We've served many staff in educating them on what comfort looks like. Um, and we spent some real time um, the first few years setting up how we could research, use applied research principles to evaluate the outcomes. And what we learned is that when people are comfortable, they use emergency room services, hospital less, they're able to reduce the number of medications that people receive, pain management is improved. There are many positive outcomes. In 2005, because of our mission and our vision and values of the campus, we were driven to serve others, teach others what we had been so privileged to learn. And through a partnership with Hospice of the Valley, we began teaching physicians and teaching other organizations here in the Phoenix area. We've trained many, many staff. We continue to train physicians and medical students monthly, um, and it's greater than, than 2,000 at this point. We continue to contribute to the community in a broad way looking at palliative principles by teaching nurses, um, social work students through ASU, and therapy students through a number of the uh, universities here in Arizona. Some points of pride in the United States as well. Um, what we were doing did not stay a secret long. And we began replicating this work in other nursing homes um, nationally, first in Illinois, and now we're in eight different states. Um, we're educating many, many people, and we're helping organizations themselves look at comfort as a vehicle for creating quality of care and quality of life, and how we help them coach. We coach them from beginning to end in making comfort a reality for all the dementia. We got an online learning program, um, which is very exciting, that will help uh, extend the influence of palliation and comfort to many outside the walls of the United States, but also across the United States. We've been working with CMS and the Institute of Medicine, again in partnership with our colleague Dr. Mary Beth Gallagher from Hospital of the Valley on a white paper that really illustrates the importance of palliation and the positive outcomes that can result. That white paper was published um, earlier this year. We run an international scholars program and in a couple of weeks. We'll be hosting some nurses from Japan. Again, the opportunity to really look at how do we widen that circle of palliation and comfort for folks, whether they're living here in Arizona, the United States, or abroad. You know, with the increase in folks who are experiencing the illness, there's great opportunity to broaden that influence of what serves people best. We've had some wonderful research studies that have been conducted in the Comfort Matters program. They've shown cost savings, 
at the desk is budget neutral, but most organizations have saved thousands of dollars in cost. We've seen that folks with dementia lose weight less often, require um, emergency department or hospitalization, the pain management is better, the environment suits them better. Um, we see that folks require less medication and there's a reduction in reliance on antipsychotic and anti-limit medication overall contributing to the, the wellness or, or the greater good for folks with um, we've, we've had eight countries attend our scholars program and receive information about foundation. And we've been working with folks in Singapore and the Ministry of Healthcare to implement palliation across their hospital and um, nursing home system. Many journal articles, we've got many book chapters that we've been uh, privileged to share the story of how important it is to focus on comfort. It's funny that often people think of comfort and they think of end of life. And all of us want to be comfortable living. But we're really talking about how people would choose to live if they could do it for themselves. And most of us have spent decades figuring out intimately what drives our comfort and what doesn't. And so the project is really geared toward figuring it out individually, celebrating the person and who they are, and helping them do for themselves the things that they would if they could. So it has a lot of appeal that goes beyond just the state of life kind of service. There's a screenshot of our, our digital learning project, and we've been working with the hospice of the ballot as well here. It's an opportunity to educate others. It goes in conjunction with some uh, live classroom didactic training, along with some uh, regular coach calls on how to help people move from point A to point B. Sometimes in, in nursing homes and assisted living, it can be a little complicated in terms of what is important and how do we help people streamline not only the practice that each role represents in serving the person that's mentioned, but also how do we change systems that should really reflect the comfort, individuality, and flexibility. We've had so much success with serving folks who have moderate to advanced dementia that we've taken the opportunity this past year to move this idea of what is comfortable, what supports people upstream. The next generation is success matters. And it's really looking at a broad range of services that can be delivered for someone who may be diagnosed but may not be, who's having some difficulty with thinking, using evaluation, equipment, and resource adaptation, some holistic education to optimize their opportunity for living. What we're hoping to see as time goes on is that these techniques and strategies can ultimately result in the reduction of utilization in the hospital and the need visit, and also create that same quality of life that comfort matters. Some basic key initiative. We're really looking at nourishing body, mind, and spirit, and doing that in a way that sounds may sound fluffy, but really is is um, founded in research. What we know really will bear itself out in terms of quality of life for folks going forward. Um, we're looking at um, how do we create adaptations for folks using equipment or resources that ultimately serve them best. How do we help them preserve, preserve their autonomy? How do we help them engage in lifelong learning if that is of importance to them? And then how do we develop evidence-based research that will become the, the foundation for this program going forward, um, developing strategies to replicate this work elsewhere since we're bound by our, our mission, vision, and values to be leaders in the field of aging services and really push this forward to others, whatever we've been published to learn. So I like Jill's slides wish list. <laughs> this is what the future holds for us. We're really going to continue this advocacy. I 
you know, locally, nationally, internationally, pushing the envelope on what comfort should look like and how it can be used as a vehicle to support people. Ultimately, what we do want to do at the end of the day is, is change the way that dementia care and dementia service is delivered to all people for all time. We need to build capacity for comfort matters. One of the things that um, became apparent to us when we were working with the Institute of Medicine was this whole idea of, of bringing things to scale. And that things that work well in, a, in one nursing home or one assisted living, how do we create the opportunity for that to be replicated in widespread ways across the country, realizing that this is a win, 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 win for folks with dementia, have better outcomes, even though we know that they're experiencing a terminal illness. Families appreciate the approach to comfort and are comfort in themselves. Organizations save money and deal with less uh, upset and distress related to family and to residents who are experiencing the illness. And finally, overall society has less burden related to resource allocation, less use of hospitals to be less medication. So win, win, win for everybody. How do we bring that to scale? And then finally, we're really looking at how do we create a strong foundation for moving comfort matters, success matters now upstream? How do we make these comfort principles available to everyone in such a way that they would become part of everyone's first thought about how do we how do we live if we happen to be impacted by some difficulties that we no matter where that is in the question of the disease, how do we develop research that ultimately supports this, allows us to learn better strategies for moving forward. And ultimately, how do we impact practice for individuals who are serving folks who are in the earlier stages? Now, so this won't have this never video embedded in its own video too. Um, I'm really not sure. Hopefully, someone will help me out here. As part of our web-based education. Um, as part of the web-based um, education, we have a cache of about 400 hours of video that teaches individuals, whether they're administrators or housekeepers, maintenance folks, whoever might come in contact with a person with dementia, teaches them the best practice. How do you help someone? How do you create comfort? How do you ultimately serve that person best? And this is a, a quick video. Uh, this is a quick video. It took four minutes and 47 seconds to film, but it demystifies this whole idea of what comfort is and how it can impact people, even the most vulnerable among us. Hi, Margie. Hang on to that teddy bear. He's a good guy. That's a bloody, bloody, bloody bad guy.
how you talked about comfort and the impact that it can make in the lives of others. Any questions? So, like in that white paper that you're talking about, is that an um, evidence or data that is um, recorded as to you know, the reduction in percentage of transmissions or the decrease in weight or the decrease in weight turnover? Yeah, it is a nice an evidence. It's an evidence based paper. And I can certainly send it out. It's really, um, I think it's well written. around dementia in that setting, they're still seeing, so they're not doing you know, your, your real comfort approach. So I thought it was more of the U.S., but I think it's just a um, very it's difficult okay. setting. It's so okay. They do, and they actually have a bar in one of the places I'm coming here. <laughs> <laughs> and, they, and they have evidence actually by giving people the cocktail that they're using a lot when they Okay. Where do I go from there? 
All right. <laughs> Well, thanks for um, having me, and um, I'm delighted to add into this conversation um, relative to um, people getting better, comfortable care before they ever get access to these programs. And in fact, I was doing this palliative care work um, with my colleagues many years ago and loving it. Didn't think I would ever do anything different. And um, the Vienna Alzheimer's Institute was formulated, and Dr. Eric Lyman, our founder, and I have been colleagues actually through the Alzheimer's Association for three years. And he hired a geriatric psychiatrist out of Rochester, Dr. Pierre Terrio, who asked me over for a visit. And I thought it was to kind of get acquainted, let's learn what's happening in dementia care when he says, I heard we should hire you. And I'm like, well, I don't really want to go. <laughs> And he said, um, what if you could do anything you wanted to do for people with dementia and their families at the time of diagnosis, what would you do? And I was like, well, I'll tell you what I do because I've been seeing crappy care now for about 10 <laughs> years. And it's really unfortunate people have to get to the last few years of their life to find comfort. You know, this is just unacceptable. So that was the carrot that <laughs> he waved in front of my nose to say how could we change um, thinking about um, care for people with, with dementia as well as their family members. So the Vienna Alzheimer's um, Institute was started in 2006, so we're just coming to our ninth anniversary, and it was the first center of excellence for Banner Health, which is kind of interesting to think that an acute care um, franchise, if you will, would want to go into the area of dementia because we know these folks are costly and hard to manage, but you know, it was Dr. Ryman's um, vision and his stellar reputation and research now that's moving us forward in the research arena, but I'll only mention that a little because I really want to talk about people and their families. So um, we were founded with a threefold mission, which is ending Alzheimer's disease before losing another generation, so that really speaks to a lot of the work happening in research, especially the prevention space, which I'll mention. Um, fortunately, I guess for me and for those who are recipients now, um, the board recognized that, well, that's great that we'll be a world-class research center, which we've become, but they understood inherently, because they were affected, that um, this affects family members tremendously, and we couldn't continue to use the usual care, which in our shop we call um, diagnose and audio. So you've got Alzheimer's disease, and get out of here, we'll see you here. That's kind of the usual treatment. But we needed to do better than that. And then there's a real effort here around the state around um, forging collaborative collaborations around biomedical research, which is really terrific. And I'm happy to say we've been doing a lot of the same around community collaborations because it really takes a community to um, better support these individuals. So within the institute, there's kind of three unique teams, the Step Family Memory Center, which is so we get the theme here, Jerry and Mary Joyce Stead, who <laughs> have been big supporters of this program. So we have a memory clinic with right now being a geriatrician, four geriatric psychiatrists, and two neuro behavioral neurologists. So a lot of expertise around that, but two social workers, neuropsychologists, advanced practice nurses, so a whole interdisciplinary team to look at diagnosis and treatment. Um, I lead a team, which I'll tell you about in just a moment, nurses, social workers, and we're all about you know, where the rubber hits the road. And then our clinical trials program is really um, phenomenal, not only offering treatment um, and neuroimaging research that is now internationally known, but this Alzheimer's Prevention Initiative, which was just a gleam in Dr. Ryman's eye, um, is now going to be launching uh, the first um, nationwide international prevention program uh, with very exciting um, therapeutics that will move forward in people who have Alzheimer's disease but um, aren't showing symptoms of dementia. So um, we're learning a lot more about people at greatest risk. So if we're going to end Alzheimer's disease, we got to target the right people. So a lot of work happening in that area, which is very exciting, um, thinking about our future so that hopefully our grandchildren will have a different experience in that old age. But in the meantime, back to family and community, really our um, essence of why we exist is, is really to support 
people who are affected by memory and thinking um, problems and their family members why they're still in communities. Our focus is really how do we wrap around them to experience success and joy, So, um, which is ultimately comfort, right? So to bring the joy word into a word like a world of all signs, people go, what do you mean joy? Um, well, there can be lots of joy if we learn how to do it right. Um, we also are very interested now because of what's happening with all the research and uh, prodromal work of people who are pre-symptomatic is we're doing a lot of um, community outreach to populations who have or are at risk for Alzheimer's disease. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. And then um, we've been charged through the Arizona Alzheimer's Consortium, so that's that big collaborative research with that wall. So one of our pieces at the Alzheimer's Institute is the ability to work with our Native American communities across the state, probably the most underserved when it comes to a lot of health issues, but particularly related to dementia, where often the word is not even understood. So um, we've been doing that as well. So we've kind of divided our work into three buckets, if you will. How do we um, educate our family caregivers? By the way, we do a lot for people with mild cognitive impairment and early stage Alzheimer's disease. So we do have groups that um, work directly with those folks where they have a capacity to still learn and make accommodations in their life to be successful in daily life because there's a lot we can do even early on. But as the disease progresses, obviously the focus of what we do is really targeted families around education. So we have some core educational programs. So after a person gets diagnosed, we hope that within the First six months, families will come through a class where not only they learn about the illness, but more importantly, they understand what are the triggers for what we like to call behavioral problems <laughs> that are really going to make these family crazy, which is kind of what you heard from Jill's work and really create a lot of stress for family caregivers. And we believe that, um, you know, why we love our physician colleagues, they provide only a really small portion of the care. The bulk of the care is non pharmacological, and it's all about how do we help caregivers learn new strategies, implement them to find success. So that's one of the programs we do another called Planning Ahead, because this is not an if you need care, it's a when you need care um, discussion, which we have right out of the gate. And um, if any of you are embroiled in trying to figure out care, it's very complicated and um, you, you can get a lot of bad advice. So this is a program that lays out kind of what you need to know from a medical, legal, financial perspective and how do you find care because you're going to need it. And then we have a core class called as Dementia Progresses because people are moving, obviously. They, they will all progress, unfortunately, into moderate stages and boy, all bets are off when you hit that stage. And this is where you know, a lot of our folks then start going off to Jill's program, which is fabulous, isn't it? That they can still be at home, because that's the, the goal. Every year we also um, query caregivers about what's most challenging to you. Tell us where, where you're struggling. And from that, we come up with special topics. So yet this year, um, we've continued on tips to avoid arguments, because family fights are huge, right? As people lose this executive function, they're not rational, and we want to take rational approaches and create chaos. In fact, I remember Dr. Hamilton saying if she had one piece of advice to get to a family member, it would be stop fighting, right, mm -hmm. with, your, with your loved one. Um, we do a lot around activities. Again, people with, with memory and thinking problems cannot is initiate or carry out activities, which is really frustrating for families. They don't get it. And yet they really want to see their loved one occupied. So um, this really helps them learn how to do that. And focus on behaviors. And then another issue that's risen in the last few years that we've been spending much more time on is helping families know how do you transition care, whether you're bringing someone into your home, whether you're trying to get your person to attend a day program, or whether ultimately it's transition into a residential setting. How do you do it? so that you can be successful because otherwise people go on blind and they feel terrible and they end up calling us for more drugs <laughs> when probably we didn't need pain drugs had we done it uh, appropriately. We do a lot also in our community because our goal is to um, 
get out to community folks who will never come to us. And our desire, we don't have enough team to see the number of people who need to be evaluated, right? But we know they need help. So we've been doing this lecture series called Getting People Strategies. Um, and every time we go out, I would say over half of people, um, it's the first class they've ever been to, and they're not patients. And again, that's not our goal to solicit patients, but to help these families uh, figure out successful strategies. Um, so I'm, we need to talk about the webinar stuff and the employer groups, because this is where, this is great, see, I didn't even know this was happening. We started these <laughs> online um, programs because um, the reality is we only see about half of the people who we see in our clinic avail themselves of our classes. Right, they can't get in, um, they don't want to bring someone in, um, we don't provide respite care at our, at our location for these sort of programs. So we started this, what we call Dementia Dialogue Series um, this year, and um, it's been incredibly successful, and I told the webinar and teleconference. So we did the teleconference because remember, we serve Native American communities. They don't have <laughs> web access. And we serve a lot of older people who are uncomfortable with web technology. So that's been a fabulous way for which to us to reach people who otherwise couldn't be reached. The other nice thing is we upload the dialogue about an hour after the presentation is done. And we have as much traffic following the session as we do during. So it really allows access for people when they're ready to kind of hear particular content. Some of our core classes, too, we videotaped, and um, they're available both for loan or purchase if people want to own a copy because there's so much content. And as soon as our web is updated, which is in classes, they'll be streamed. So again, the idea that you could just watch a class virtually so you don't have to come in, I think, is just really important. And our caregivers of the future are just web savvy. They're just a different breed of folks. So I think the more we employ technology as you're doing this is really important. We also have, you know, written materials so people all learn in different formats, and that's what we're trying to accommodate. So we've been putting out this, we call it our VA at Beacon now for eight years, and it's very dementia specific. It's very focused on a topic, um, and we did that purposely, short and sweet, because caregivers are so overwhelmed. We saturate them too much, they just shut down. So this year, our beacon is kind of our abridged version of what will be our dialogue, which is really great. So our dementia dialogue kind of explodes the topic, if you will, and provides a lot more detail that's been really effective. We wrote a book called Navigating Through Memory Loss that um, we utilize with folks who come to our clinic. Again, all of the strategies we talk through in all these classes, we all have got to talk the same language. So same thing, our physician providers have to go to our classes, they have to read this book. So when they're hearing people on the phone, they can say, I hear there's too much demand on this person. This is what I don't need you to do versus, oh, okay, I'm going to increase your seroquel dose. So, um, you know, that's kind of our expectation. So hopefully they're hearing it, they're reading it, they're listening to it. And then we started these tip cards um, because it's short and sweet. So we're um, trying to get very basic information like avoiding arguments and how to overcome apathy and how to deal with your stress, those kinds of things, and very short, sweet things where a primary care physician is sort of trying to invade the inner health. <laughs> and our primary care physicians say, here, use this, right? Just something very simplistic. So um, our impact is that we offer over about 60 classes per year around the valley, reaching about 2,000 unique um, caregivers. Our GPS series is in its fifth year. We reach about 500 people a year kind of through that. And then our dialogues has been hitting up to about 200 participants per month. But you can see there's still, I mean, the capacity issues are significant. So the more we can work together or help to share different venues for getting information, right, because this is part of our nonprofit mission, and you'll see what you all have helped find. Our beacon, as I said, it's in its eight year. You know, it's hard to know actual distribution because we have so many people who send it out, like Stephanie sends it out to multiple people in her network, right, because we all have dementia in one way or another. And, and our readers just love it. You know, it's um, a lot of work to put this out every month until somebody comes in and says, I feel like you wrote this just for me, right? And you go, okay, this worked really okay. um, Our navigating book is in its second edition with about 2,000 copies distributed. 
We have one that's similar for our native community, uh, but very culturally specific. And also how literacy has been factored in. So the readability is more on the fifth, sixth grade level that has very cultural components. Um, we will also have just gone into our second edition of about 5,000 copies um, that have gone out across our um, native communities and also being used in Canada. And then our text card are just really, we're just testing them now in some of our primary care settings within Banner to see are these helpful for our primary care physicians. And we do a number of support groups um, really geared towards specialty kinds of topics. Um, and they're, they're run through us, not through the Alzheimer's Association. And I'm honest about that because they have collected a lot of data that wasn't particularly helpful and burdened some to our groups. And so um, we run groups for adult children. Our circle of friends is both spousal and adult children typically to come to that. We've expanded to the East Valley, interestingly. So we're in Central Phoenix. 50% of our patient base comes from the East Valley. There's nothing out there. It's really um, kind of a lonesome place. We have some um, more atypical kinds of dementia. So if you've got a frontal temporal disease, going to an Alzheimer's group just isn't going to work for you. And this is the only one in the state with about 30 participants a month, 100 people that come online. And a huge Facebook following that is that is really um, facilitated by these what we call caregiver mentors. These are a couple of gals whose husbands died of frontal temporal disease, and they're there to connect with new people. So our experience of really bringing folks in has been helpful. And what is that? Frontal temporal dementia is something you never want to learn that you have. <laughs> So when Tina talked about losing this um, front portion of your brain, that's kind of your social behavior, it's how your decision making. So unfortunately, it goes two ways. Either you develop a behavioral variant where you start doing very naughty things, often that looks sociopathic, um, or you could develop a language variant where you either can produce language or you don't have a clue what someone's saying to you. So it's very disabling, often happening to people in their 50s and 60s. So we get people kind of in their prime, often with kids in the home, they're planning for um, putting kids through school. So it creates a lot of family chaos, is what I would say. So really distressing. So rules are different on this. Even with hospice, this is where um, they don't die like people with Alzheimer's die. And a lot of the criteria around hospice care is written based on dying from Alzheimer's. Well, they're not all the same, right? So so this is where you know our partnerships are working together to demonstrate, yeah, we think they're hospice eligible, even though they're still walking, and Medicare says no, we shouldn't be. Right? So they're very unique differences. Same with the Lewy body dementia, um, which when I started working for the Alzheimer's Association years ago, it was a, more of an atypical, and now it's like the third, third leading cause of dementia. So it's a Parkinsonian kind of dementia, if you will, except they hallucinate. When they go to the doctors like to prescribe an antipsychotic, which just makes it worse. So there's a lot of challenges. So that's why we run some of these kinds of groups because they need really experienced expertise because we're trying to avoid drug and we're trying to keep them comfortable at home. We have a men's group only and um, women, you are not welcome unless they asked you in. So I love that they're very tight in their community. Um, and then we've started a group for people with mild cognitive impairment. So this is kind of a pre Alzheimer's state, but the conversion rate of these folks is pretty high. About 20% per year will develop dementia. So they will have full-blown memory and thinking problems that impairs everyday life. So some of our future plans, um, one is a, is a dedicated caregiver mentor program where we take caregivers who have finished their experience of caregiving and are really interested in mentoring someone new into the experience, because some people really need kind of a more one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so we're working on that, especially around atypical illnesses. And then um, we're also in process of, of looking at ambiguous loss, which is really um, what caregivers experience is, uh, my person's really alive, but they're no longer here with me. You know, a lot of ambiguity, which creates a lot of stress. And actually this still stems from our work at hospice where the underlying issue of grief and loss is never addressed until right around death, which I find unacceptable. So we have changed the paradigm of thinking about 
addressing these issues in the now when people are living with profound grief. And yet if we ask caregivers, are you grieving? I say, no, no, what do you mean? And then we go and we talk to them and they go, oh my gosh, that's why I'm feeling this way. So it's interesting how we label them as, and they are stressed, and we say they're depressed. I will tell you they're depressed because they were not dealing effectively with their grief. And mindful burst would be, you know, again, a strategy to help cope in the day to day. So you can see how all this stuff just in one way. Again, when we started eight years ago, um, the state of opportunities for people to live in rich lives in the community was terrible. Um, we had community centers that didn't want people with memory and thinking problems in there because it creates trouble for them. The, their busy centers, they're fast paced, they couldn't accommodate, didn't want to accommodate. We had adult day health care programs that quite honestly um, were very unsophisticated with programming and felt often like warehouses for um, you know, uh, caregivers when we sent them to look. So we um, have a lovely opportunity to work with the Maricopa Partnership for Arts and Culture, which is was with uh, Myra Millinger and had funding from another number of community partners to form this arts engagement program. So we did a two-year study looking at how we could work with the Phoenix Art Museum, the Symphony, and the Stetson Museum of Contemporary Art to create these partner programs that were very interactional between a person with dementia and a partner and a docent. And um, yesterday, I'm happy to say, I was back at the Phoenix Art Museum. They're launching their ninth year, which is amazing at capacity, and um, seeing this beautiful experience. And I was with a former colleague of such a small world, Nancy White, who was also at Hospice of the Valley. She's now at Desert Botanical Gardens. And we're hoping to start an arts engagement program at Desert Botanical. So there we were, and kind of she was seeing these docents in action. So we bring the dementia specific. This is what you need to know. This is how you interact. This is how you program. And they bring their program. So um, that has gone beautifully. Uh, but it wasn't enough for our participants, right? You give them a little and they want more. And so they said, well, this is great. But the problem with these arts engagement programs is they take time off right in the summer. Go figure. So, we started a program called With Art in Mind um, at the Institute, which is a weekly art expression program where people with dementia come in and they talk about art, they learn about art, and then they create art. And um, it's been such a success that it's become somewhat of a beast and that people want in and we're at a capacity issue. So we've actually been working with the Phoenix Center for the Arts to say how can we help you to maybe want to take this. You have capacity during your day, right? Because their kids, their programs are largely for working adults and children, so they have an empty site. And we get folks who need to come to empty sites during the day. So they're going to be um, taking on with art in mind um, come January to um, do this. So we've been training their working artists and, and helping their volunteers. And we've done three um, month-long programs, so they're just ready to go. We're talking with Oakwood Creative Care and Benavia, saying how can we create a class-like experience in a day program, so they also get used to going to the day program so that when it's time to transition, um, it's not such a frightening um, place. So another great opportunity for um, collaboration. And then speaking of music, so here we have with Art in Mind going, and one of our caregivers came to me and said, you know, Jan, it's really nice that you're doing all this work around art, but here's the thing, my wife likes music. So what are you gonna do about music? Well, my colleague Robin Rio at the ASU School of Music Therapy, turns out her specialty is dementia. So we got together and started dreaming about what could we do that could be in the community that would serve people with dementia to enjoy music, and what resulted was a collaboration between the City of Tempe, ASU School of Music Therapy, and us, and it's now a weekly music therapy program, and again, that's so big, they're launching a second program. So, um, it's really, so people should enjoy music, and again, that comes from my work at hospice, that music can do so much at the end of life when your brain is is really been ravaged by illness, just like what it could do early on, right? It isn't, shouldn't it be a continuum? So um, that's been very exciting. So, um, and then we do a cognitive engagement program um, for people with dementia, a discussion group, because nobody asks you once you learn to have Alzheimer's disease, what do you think about something? 
or they ask you in a way that you're likely to give them a wrong answer, and now I'm going to convince you why you're wrong. So um, that can happen. We've got to find ways to allow people to express their ideas and opinion, and there is no bad idea or no wrong opinion, right? It just works for them, and it works for the group. So this, too, has become such a huge success we're maxed out. We, we have capacity issues. So I've approached the Tempe Library to say, you have the library, you must have retired librarians, and they can host a discussion group when they're very interested. And they have a coffee shop where the caregivers could meet. So I think our, our ability to look at pushing out capacity in community is huge. This isn't where folks live, the community. We want them in community. So I mentioned a little bit about reaching out to groups with or at risk for Alzheimer's disease. So when they know you work for an Alzheimer's Institute, the big question I always get is, what can I do to prevent Alzheimer's disease? I do crossword puzzles, is that enough? So we get that all the time. What do you think about lumosity? What about happy neurons? And, and the thing is, it's not that easy. So with the help of the BHHS Legacy Foundation, we have launched this program, very successfully called um, the Brain Gym Bootcamp. But I'll tell you that um, we got a cease and assist order from um, a company who owns the Brain Gym kinesiology around golf and they're worried about us with teaching theology <laughs> right now. But, so anyways it's gonna it's gonna get renamed um, out of respect. So I just like you know when you hear it you're gonna see it come up back and they prefer to kind of have this cool icon logo mm -hmm. yeah. 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 but it, it, we've got three really awesome things and it's amazing when you go into public domain to see anything around brain health, you name it, it has, so we were going to do jog, jog in your noggin, <laughs> it's trademarked, <laughs> just shows you this space is hot, and people are desperate, so actually this is a two and a half hour um, experience where people actually self-rate their, their brain health based on cognitive domains, and then we lead them, so it's a little bit about lifestyle, but most of us know we should eat right and exercise, right, we get a good night's sleep, that's no secret. They really want the mental component. So we lead them through what does a memory exercise look like? What does a, a, an executive function or thinking exercise look like? What does an abstract activity look like? What is a visual spatial because that's kind of and how do they work together and separate? So at the end of this experience, you kind of go through and, and they go through an experiential and you have to rate how easy or hard it is, often where they're struggling parallels to how they rated themselves cognitively. And from there, then we say, here are your opportunities for how you might improve your brain health. So you're not going to see us promoting Lumosity, although I'll tell you, so it's an excellent program. Rather, we're going to talk about um, maybe if visual spatial is a problem, you should go and take a class at the community center on photography. That is very visual spatial. And by the way, you're also going to be working on attention, <laughs> right? So, and you're going to be with other people, which we know the impact of being with others. So now we've given you one activity that's going to hit multiple domains. So we're really getting people, I hope, to think about brain health and mental exercise in a more holistic, um, realistic way. Um, but it's been very exciting, and we use volunteers actually to help us launch that because. The demand is so huge. Our classes are kept at around 20 to 25. As soon as they open, they're filled with a waiting list. So the demand, as you can imagine, is, is huge. So we've had about 800 people participate in a boot camp just this year. Um, so we do about three to four a month, as many as we can get. Boy, they, like I say, they just fill a lot of volunteers. And we're now bringing this to Pinal Gila and Pima County since we found folks that we could train and said, Hey, you just go for it. You know, it's it's built. Um, it's it's relatively cheap to offer, and it's free, by the way, to community participants. So people love it, and the trainers love it. So finally, our Native American program. I just want to mention that um, we've been at this now for for eight years, and um, reaching out to various tribal and urban um, communities of folks, really trying to understand the needs and understanding the issues that are being faced and the reality is there's a lot of um, undiagnosed dementia out there and what's interesting about our native culture is that um, their paradigm of aging is that you begin your life as a child and you end your life as a child well that's uh, those of us who know Alzheimer's disease or that would be true 
Um, and they very much live in a spirit world. So when one starts visiting um, their family um, actively, um, they see it as preparing for death. We see it as hallucination. So it's a really interesting opportunity because just recently we were down in Tohoto Odom Nation in their nursing home. And before I went down, a nurse educator called me and said, now don't you dare talk about hallucinations with these folks. And we don't use antipsychotics. And I'm like, great. But we are going to talk about you know, psychosis. It's, it happens. But in a respectful way to say, if it's not uncomfortable to the person, why would we treat it? But if it becomes distressing to them, clearly they're not comfortable. And what become our options? So kind of how we talk about things is, is very, very respectful. So we've had high impact. This picture on the right, we commissioned um, a Navajo um, artist to do a rendering of um, brain health. So again, there's such a need because, as you know, type 2 diabetes, which is will raise your risk factor for getting Alzheimer's by three times. There's, there's so much head injury on the reservations because of um, people not wearing seatbelts and kids being thrust out of vehicles. So we wanted to take a much more holistic perspective as we talk about brain health, which includes Alzheimer's disease or related dementias in our native um, communities. And this um, picture really depicts all of the tribal elements and each portion of this really depicts um, an aspect of what it means to be brain healthy from a cultural perspective. The other thing we're doing, so we have a, as part of our, we are coming through the state, we follow a small group of Native American individuals in a healthy aging longitudinal study, looking at cognitive aging and the batteries they, of testing that they get. And in October, we're um, hosting the first um, con national conference on Alzheimer's disease for health professionals who are serving Native populations. So, um, this is really targeted at Indian Health Services, um, uh, just a lot of the tribal communities across the country and in Canada. So um, very exciting. And a lot of this then from the Indian perspective is tracking policy. They're very, so we got a big track on policy because things don't change unless the policy change. So um, this, those of you maybe who know about Indian Health um, Services, it's complicated and so we're partnering with our uh, folks on that. So some future directions. I wasn't it smart enough to put a wish list up like <laughs> some people. <laughs> I know. But um, let me tell you where, where all this is converging at this point, which I'm really excited about. You know, one is we just it's we've got to grow community partnerships. We cannot work at this alone. We need each other and we each have a piece of in doing well in this. And our goal is kind of how do we help programs, people to become what we call more dementia capable. You don't have to be an expert, but you can be capable. And it's a lot of what Tina is saying and Jill is saying. So uh, we are happy to say that we've become a champion for a new initiative called Dementia Friendly America. So in Japan and in Europe, um, over the last several years, they have been working on what they call these dementia friendly communities. <coughs> That really begins kind of with civic engagement and looks at transportation and business and signage and healthcare and access and community service. And so Tempe, because Mark Mitchell, Mayor Mitchell, his his mom has Alzheimer's disease, and his dad Harry, a very good friend of ours, and, and helping us also learn. And so. They declared they would be um, the first, they wanted to be the first site. So we are hosting as champions, meaning that we will facilitate. This is all about community. So for me, it's really exciting to think about it all comes together where, so for example, not to be critical, but when I came to get on the elevators here today, this would be an example of a not so dementia friendly elevator. I was like, <laughs> 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 so um, it, it really looks at kind of environmentally what can we do, um, how do we work with our first responders, how, what do bankers need to know so if they're assisting a customer who clearly is um, struggling, they can befriend that person. What does that mean for a bus driver who is, you know, and Jill and I talked about this should be for all people, right? It's really sensitivity around 
groups of people who are struggling and how can we become a friend to them. So this will be a lot of our work and again where I think we can take you know many of our programs and start embedding them within the city of Tempe and be a pilot to say how's it working and where the city, the community owns these programs because you shouldn't have to come to the Banner Alzheimer's Institute to get this kind of care and service. Can you talk to Meg? Because they've got their age friendly. Yes. Oh, yeah. So, oh, yeah. So, we're actually working with a, um, there's a group, Dementia Friendly America out of Minnesota. By the way, Minnesota started this work a couple of years ago. They've got 32 sites up and running. They've got wonderful platforms that are built and technical support that's going to come off to us so that we have a logistical way to um, bring up communities. And it's based on community needs. So I won't go into the committee and say, Tempe, you need this and this and this. Rather, the city really begins to identify, here's where we have needs. How can we start? And that's where we come in to bring dementia capability along with our community partners. So to make sure the Alzheimer's Association is at the table and the area agency is there. So I mean, and Tempe Community um, Action Agency. Mm -hmm. So kind of brings partners together and hopefully begins much more active discussion so we're not working in isolation but that we can really build synergistic partnerships so um, finally um, with gratitude um, we could not have done this work without the work of so many of our funders and you'll see we had a number of our um, Indian communities also support this work which is really validating that it matters to them also about how they they care for their elders so that's what we've been up to, and that's why I left out in here. <laughs> we could, so it's lovely to be reunited and reminded of how lucky we are to live in a community with um, really passionate, mm -hmm. dedicated folks from um, trying to help people live with this illness. Wonderful. Any questions? I this really applies to all three. Um, efforts, I think, but I'm particularly interested in a lot of the community programming that you're working on. How are we doing as a community getting those programs and services to very low-income families and very disconnected families? Like, aside from your outreach efforts with the reservation, how are we doing there locally with very low income? So I think we could do better, but cost is not the barrier. Um, more aware, like in terms of are they aware of our programming and stuff like that. There's, there's many challenges, which is why I'm excited about the Dementia Friendly Initiative, because right now there's such a stigma of having a diagnosis of dementia. So I work and live in a bubble. I'll be the first to admit that if you're willing to walk into a building that says Alzheimer's Institute combined together, you must think you're crazy walking into a building, right? I mean, according to how our world thinks about Alzheimer's disease, so we work largely with people who recognize that there's an issue. We've got a project working with Banner Health and the primary care physicians, um, looking at how they could better identify and then diagnose and manage these folks. And in our first launch of this work, um, which is, is very helpful and illuminates a lot of the issue, people were outwardly angry with the physician. I came to see for my blood pressure, what do you mean you're telling me that you want to work me out for mm -hmm. an impairment? Or calling back and saying, why did you do this? Did my daughter tell you that, that I should have a memory test? So there, there's a lot of um, social stigma around these illnesses, which is why we need to break it down. And where I think if it, and we don't have to call it Alzheimer's or dementia, we don't we just we have to accommodate experiences in communities where people hear like, oh, did you care about the music program? At which way I call it music and memories. There's nothing in the A or D word that's on the pamphlets. We all know it's targeted, but then they find a program where they fit and they feel comfortable um, and they're and what's happening in their situation gets normalized. So I think we have to really Think about that, and you know, I'm happy to say I'm a Piper Fellow this year. And one of the things I did was to visit Stanford University and their design thinking. And I can't, actually, my project's going to be around design thinking because I don't think we fully understand why is this such a barrier. Because in my world, I'm thinking, well, you've got a problem, right? You get on it. Well, that's not. That's not. Why do these other people not 
feel that way, and then how do we how do we design programming that's supportive but not intrusive? Mm -hmm. Because um, I think we all know a lot, but we make assumptions that maybe are missing the mark. So I think we've just got a lot to learn here in that mm -hmm. regard. Mm -hmm. And I, I would add to that that that's the reason I felt strongly around LTEX because many of the people on our program don't think they have dementia, and that's fine. Yeah. They just have problems we need to help them deal with. Mm -hmm. So they'll come in with a diagnosis of dementia, which you know we don't even say, "Well, we hear you have dementia." We don't need to. Mm -hmm. They've got the problems. We can help them deal with it. Because mm -hmm. if you don't get them that way, you're not going to get most of those people. Because they don't say, I mean, they have advanced dementia, and you know, family members are seeing them have memory problems. So it's a language, and I don't need them to say they have dementia. I don't care. I don't really believe in the treatments as being that important. Managing the care for the patient is what counts, and then you do that without their saying, oh, I have Alzheimer's. And in our clinic, we say it once because we think people have the right to hear it. But after that, we tell you you have we, you have dementia. We believe it's the Alzheimer's type, um, and we know you hate that word. Um, it's gone. So we talk to most people about um, memory problems. You know, you have a memory problem because we all have memory problems, right? So, um, so we really try to minimize it because it doesn't need to be a, a hot button topic. And then we just kick the patient off. who's now got to get in the car to ride home with a caregiver who now you know they're going to be paranoid and accusatory. We did not help that situation. We just made it worse. Mm -hmm. So, and that's a lot of our work too with primary care docs. How do you talk about it? How do you normalize um, just a chronic condition? That's how we see it. It's a chronic, it's a chronic condition, and we can help. That's what I think people need to hear. You've got a chronic condition, we can help. I think. I think also if there's this cultural um, diversity that has occurred in, in the Phoenix area, in particular, but also throughout the state. And, and really, we should be looking at how do we help people meet them where they are, given whatever their particular uh, life experience has been. Mm -hmm. And that, that really creates, you know, creates the, 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 the opportunity to have programs that are really flexible mm -hmm. and, and is, are available to people no matter what their socioeconomic background is, but is really culturally sensitive and friendly mm -hmm. um, because everyone is so unique in how they. Approach um, a situation where they have trouble thinking. Mm -hmm. Right, a lot of our patients are Hispanic, and Spanish speaking only is an elderly couple. Mm -hmm. So we can still be useful. Mm -hmm. Melanie, I knew you wanted to cover something that's growing that's, that may be of help. Yes, absolutely. So I've spoken with a couple of you a little bit about this. It has been an opportunity that has come very quickly, and so we're kind of having to move quickly to capitalize on it. So Robert Wood Johnson, um, at the end of last year, started the SCALE process, which is studying community accelerators through learning and evaluation. We did a request for proposals. They selected a very small number of kind of coalition communities to fund. But in the process of that, um, they funded up in March. They realized there were many, many more communities that could utilize this coalition building capacity side of the conversation. So they had Robert Wood Johnson in partnership with um, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. They are moving towards selecting an additional 200 communities to engage through the pathway, the Pace Center program, which is actually to expand this scale initiative. And we really believe here at San Health Initiative that this is an opportunity to tap into a national network, build resources for large scale systems change. It very much aligns with our work, aligns very, very closely with the Tell's work, the Toby here as our strategic learning director. And she really just grabbed the little line of horns and said, let's go. So we have the opportunity for up to six public listed and five coalitions to be engaged in this process. I know there is not an Alzheimer's coalition at the community level. There is that the Alzheimer's consortium that's more from that research perspective and accountable group. And I think it would serve very well to launch a backbone to then pull together those here at the table and some of the ones that are not at the table. So, like, I'm on Alonzo at the State Health Department, Mr. 
they asked me about engaging with the work that they are already funding through the um, Alzheimer's participation to kind of circle wagons and say, hey, we really have a great opportunity and have a lot of incredible work that's going on here in Arizona. Let's bring it together and be able to get it out to those in lower income communities that are Spanish speakers and do it in a more coordinated effort. So it would be RWJ money coming in to mm -hmm. Arizona to help with the convenience. Yes. And sort of the training of how do you pull all the partners yep. together. And so we want to apply on behalf of the Alzheimer's community mm -hmm. in order to try and get funding to do that convenience. And one of the, the big pieces that we're having to move really quickly on is they are doing a face-to-face -face convening in uh, September. It's September 28th. Or 29th, 30th, October 1st, and 7th. And we're looking to identify three to five individuals that would be able to attend from what would be this coalition. And St. Luke's is looking to cover the half of that travel. So it wouldn't be a financial burden on that organization. It would just be your time commitment to build the coalition moving it forward. It is an 18 month project, so it's not just a, a one and done, it's a long term investment. That's not kind of. We show how great we're doing here with Alzheimer's and dementia care in Arizona. So we can have a funding opportunity for that region. Again, to your point of sort of pulling all the players together, this this would help do that. So I would have to actually submit the application today. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> one diabetes coalition went in this morning. Um, and, <laughs> I know. It's the fun. You guys don't have to submit it. I would. It's not bad. It. It's really just an initial. <laughs> hey, we're interested in this coalition group moving forward. You don't have to be a formal coalition. It doesn't matter what stage you're at as a coalition. It really is to help advance the work. And we think no one else from Arizona is applying so far that we've seen. So we 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 kind of I, I sent it out because I got wind of it last week and Raquel really jumped on it and said, this is what we do. This is the coalition work that we do. So could we expand it to some of the other coalitions that we haven't been working with? So I have a couple of handouts, particularly for the presenters and for your groups to take with you. What I would like to ask your permission to have you all in the room at once, so I was like, oh, good timing, <laughs> is if I could list you as members of kind of primary team for the coalition, so we can have about say six or seven members total. And then I would be the point person for the St. Luke Health Initiatives for the coalition. So I'll send everything to you electronically too. Um, so these handouts you can review. And if you can at some point either after this meeting or even before you leave take a look at your calendars and see is there any way you can take a, a trip to Baltimore in the September and early October? Or you might have another person within your team that might be a good fit for them. And then from the funder's perspective, that may be a way to help us. What we could do is fund the consortium. Right. So it would have broader tentacles mm -hmm. going out. So that we thought it's worth a shot yeah. to try and build the consortium. Mm -hmm. And that then it, it might make it easier for us funders mm -hmm. to do it as a group. Yeah, so it's really just kind of a starting line, perfect timing, to jump on the opportunity. The other thing I just want to make a quick announcement is we have opened our innovation grants information. It's all live on the website. There's also flyers over here, there's a couple brochures. If you want to grab one before you head out and just let me know if you have any questions as you start going through the book. Okay. And then one thing, if we've got a couple minutes, Wayne, you might want to talk about that the whole issue of uh, Alzheimer's moving up and what that what that sure. does. Sure. So as we said here, our Alzheimer's is officially the fourth leading cause of death in Arizona. Thanks in large part to our state children, so we're passing through and putting huge numbers on the map. Uh, stroke moved out, as Sudan was saying, mostly only not the fewer strokes, but the uh, greater survival rates and hospital systems getting up to speed up on uh, stroke treatment. Um, soon, even maybe as we said here, Alzheimer's might be the third leading cause. 
but that you know, some of the pulmonary disease, COPD, asthma, and, and the whole group there is uh, been holding steady in, in Alzheimer's is this, this way of coming through. Probably will never catch heart and cancer, which are probably three times the rate of death right now that any other disease would be. But as a result of that, uh, we can dedicate a portion of tobacco tax dollars in Arizona uh, to Alzheimer's because it's uh, by law we can dedicate uh, a portion of tobacco taxes to the four leading causes of disease related death. So, not including injuries, which is protection of the three or something, but looking at disease related causes of death. So, we're looking at that now. It's, it's, a, it's a good moment. It's, a, it's good to get stroke out of there, and it's good to say we're, we're addressing. We set up stroke. <laughs> and, um, we set up stroke quite well with the sustainable system of genes. So I think that they're doing okay. But uh, yeah, so we, we, you know, very much uh, want to be a player in this. Um, and uh, look, uh, borrowing from what Kina said earlier, I think that the terms uh, replicability and high impact and you know population health kind of perspective, that's what the state health department needs to look at. So we look at state right things, but certainly this. Uh, Coalition development would be, would be a great um, opportunity, and, and the state would have to be part of that. And I co chair what's the, been working on with Kara Chris, the new director of DHS, the Arizona Health Improvement Plan, which is supposed to be a five year kind of plan looking at public health and medical health and combining that. So that's how I got wind of this. Is I've been helping to co chair the steering committee and the process for that. And my sense is Alzheimer's will get worked into that uh, some yeah, way. Yeah, but it may be emerging, emerging issues. issues. I think it's more than emerging. <laughs> <laughs> well, and also from DES perspective, they have an Alzheimer's task force that kind of looks at all of the different types of issues that are going on and how they can be addressed. Mm -hmm. well. yeah. yeah. And that should actually, actually, I'm on the uh, leadership committee of that. And I think that'll produce in the next few weeks. Yeah. So the goal would be to pull all this together so that you've got state connections as well as the nonprofit groups that are working on it and and then I fundamentally believe we need to bring the insurance companies in as well because again as you talk about from all text Bridgeway and uh, first care plan get it but we've got a lot of other commercial players that are also dealing with this so there's interest in reducing their costs yeah I think well. just uh, just contracted with us some of their high flyers. Yeah. So all those plans. Yeah. So we would pull them in as well because it's in their enlightened self-interest to uh, understand this. <laughs> uh, yeah. We would probably pull access together as well. So like Jill said, the hospital costs are you know, three to five times more on the Medicaid side to spend it's 19 times greater for people with dementia. So. Um, they should be highly incentivized. Mm -hmm. yeah. the folks who are going to be so that's why we're to do. We'll send the link. Uh, yeah. Let access know that you want the flexibility in the waiver to uh, allow some of this, even if it's on a pilot project, because that helps us get some the ability to try some. Of this gives access the ability through CMS to kind of uh, look at this differently. And because what they're trying to do is reduce the costs. And so you've got that. We, we want to make sure that input gets into access and gets into CMS, and thereby gets into CMS. So that's the first thing you can do is make sure your good data gets to them. So so if the so I I have the follow-up says get the link to the access comments, which we can do, and that's the end of September. If you think you can participate in this potential consortium, we would love to have all of you participate. And uh, we'll be back to the funders to at least say we'd like to keep monitoring this mm -hmm. to see if that's a way to do it. We can let the other AGF members know as well. Um, and uh, then I think we'll, but I appreciate this has been fascinating. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we knew, every, I think everybody knew part of it. But to have everybody know mm -hmm. all of it uh, does better for us. And it sounds like you guys picked up a few, few new things too. So we <laughs> <laughs> should go out to Shibley. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's so funny when we meet, we have to catch up where our kids are. You ever have time? <laughs> <laughs> I understand. So, uh, 
for members, we have a, a, a evaluation that would be helpful. AGF members, if you could fill out the evaluation form. Um, and uh, what we'll probably do is be back in touch with this, and then maybe what we thought we might do for the uh, AGF affinity group is kind of solicit your ideas for what a next um, group might be where we bring together. This really came out of our initial conversation, so we want to look at uh, what else might be meaningful for the affinity group to do. So, all right, anything else for the good of the order? All right, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.